Today we welcome Mark Vitash for our return visit to our podium. Mark is a graduate from Iowa State University where he received his BS and MS degrees. He's worked as a professional photographer, not a photographer, no, he's not. He's a forester, that's what he is. And he's, he's worked as a professional forester for almost 20 years. He's uh, also an author. He and his daughter wrote a wonderful book, a uh, children's book, uh, which I think is over here with the books to be checked out, right? Uh, we're fortunate to have Mark residing in Iowa City, and he has his office out at the extension, uh, at the Johnson County Extension offices. He's going to tell us about common landscape trees of Johnson County, the winners and losers. So please welcome Mark Vitosh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. You got me hooked up there? Yep. All right. Can you hear me out there? OK, great. Um, <clears throat> hopefully my voice uh, lasts. I, the last three days, I've been screaming a lot. Uh, if you didn't know, City High won the state championship last night. And <laughs> I know somebody that plays. So. And thank goodness we won because it would have been two years of therapy because she missed a few three throws at the end. So uh, <laughs> we won. Uh, that's all it counts. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I feel honored every time that Melanie asked me to come. And, uh, but I have to give you a couple qualifiers. Uh, I'm not a landscape architect. I'm not a horticulturist. And I'm not a nursery person. I'm just kind of what people call a dirt forester. And, and I've been doing this for about 20 years. I spent, 20, I spent a few years in Oklahoma and then a number of years at Iowa State University working the whole state and then in 2000 I was able to come back to this area and I was hired with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources as a district forester. And basically I cover four counties, Johnson County, Lynn, Scott, and Muscatine and uh, I work with private landowners in those areas to help with their natural resources, mostly their forest. I do some prairie work if somebody has some but I tend to concentrate on the trees. Um, so I'm not going to get real scientific. I'm, I'm just going to give you my observations. I, I think one of the best horticulturists in the state is Dr. Jeff Isles, who's spoken here before. He can give you a list of cultivars and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to tell you this tree, that tree. And I'm going to give you my observations, things I've seen, and hopefully at the end uh, answer some questions. So what I'm going to try to do today is um, tell you a little bit why trees are important. You know that, but just kind of remind you. Um, and then I'm going to, one of the critical things I think about with this in trees is sometimes we just say, I want to plant this kind of tree. And then we just go plant it. What I want you to think about is I want you to look at your area and say, what kind of tree will fit? What kind of tree will fit this spot? And what kind of tree will help me meet my goals? And, and for almost every situation, there's a plant that'll fit, be it a tree, a shrub, or whatever, but you gotta match the two together. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about proper selection. Then I'm gonna talk about plants to avoid based on my observations, things I think uh, for different reasons, diseases, maybe they're invasive in the woods, all those kind of things. I'm gonna give you a few plants that I think I'd be cautious about utilizing. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the ones that, uh, that have done well thing you got to remember is every plant, every tree has some type of problem. Something. I mean, even the good ones I'm going to list that have done well, I'll list a number of oaks. They have oak wilt. We'll talk about that a little bit. So every plant has a problem. Now with that said, I do have to announce today there's a new selection out there that they're finding that doesn't have a lot of problems. It's one of the first ones on the market. <clears throat> they're working on it pretty hard. The scientific name of it is um, Betula plasticiata. Plasticiata. <laughs> this is Betula plasticiata. The good thing about Betula plasticiata is it never drops its leaves. <laughs> also, it never grows in the landscape. This is a planted tree, by the way. Not in Johnson County, but I was driving in Muscatine County, and this is Betula plasticiata. This is a plastic tree planted in the yard. Um, it is evergreen, so it shows up and uh, works well in the landscape. Like I said, they're never going to have to rake leaves, they're never going to have to do anything. 
I always joke about plastic is best, and I finally found an example in the landscape. So I, I was allowed to show this. Um, but every tree has a prop. So on a more serious note, uh, this is beautiful. This is Iowa City. I believe it's Market Street. I mean, everyone thinks about trees um, driving down something like this. It, and, and if you go in other places where these trees, trees haven't developed yet, it's just not a place you want to be. But we also know that uh, trees attract people. There's a lot of research out there, and I was going to give you all kinds of numbers, and I actually had slides, and I started going. They're just numbers. But we know people come to these areas on a hot day, you can sit places, you can keep going. People will stay around longer. They, they just like to be here. This is actually downtown Iowa City at the Ped Mall. Um, but there, there's a lot of benefits to trees. It, it also has a softening effect. Trees just, this is a parking lot, University of Iowa over by Hancher. It just, you know, there's car cement there, but there's just something about that that kind of softens it. So they, they can do a lot of things for us. The other thing is, we know there's a lot of numbers with trees and shade. There's, you can look at a lot of different research and stuff, and they talk about trees can reduce air conditioning costs anywhere from 20 to 50 percent if they're placed properly. And with energy costs the way they are, shade trees is, you know, and there's energy companies, uh, Mid American and Alliant have tree programs that they promote tree planting because they see the benefits of trees. Um, <clears throat> Another benefit is we know through research that that can add value to the landscape when it comes to reselling it. I mean, people see an oak like that that's probably over 100 years old. You know, that's, that's attractive. That's some place they may want to live, okay? And in the wintertime, those trees can, um, if they're placed correctly, they can do a lot of things. They can reduce heating costs somewhere, between, I've seen numbers between 5, 20, 25 percent if they're placed correctly from north winds. The other thing they can do in the summertime, they can act as a screen. This is my backyard, okay? There's a park back there, but I never see it, and I hardly ever hear it because I have this screen. I have birds. I have this owl that I talk to if people think I'm crazy, but there's an owl that comes to my backyard. I have a creek back there. Um, it's just, you know, the kind of out of sight, out of mind. So there's, there's just great value to that. And I know the winter's been tough and stuff, but that's pretty. I mean, there's just a lot of beauty in that. Trees are also a legacy. It's a way to leave a legacy. It's not about us now. It's, it's about later. Um, but this is just... Uh, one of the ladies at my work, I actually work out of the extension office, and this is uh, her family planting a tree last fall. But trees that start like that and maybe end up like that, they leave a legacy. That if those trees could talk, just think of the things that they can say with a nice swing there. This is a bur oak, and I know there's some like this in Johnson. This one isn't. A lot of my pictures are from Johnson. I like this one so much, though. This is actually in Scott County over by LeClaire. I drive by it every summer a couple times doing a project I do and that thing's probably 200 years old you know it's just there's a lot of history in trees the tough thing that you know some trees can live that long but on average trees in urban areas I've seen numbers 20 to 40 years you know in a park situation maybe 60 to 70 years but when you get like in your yard between the street and sidewalk, sometimes they don't live as long. So it, it depends where they're planted. <clears throat> Again, I said trees have a softening effect, but they also can affect water quality. We know the tree roots can absorb lots of things moving through the system, uh, overflow. Uh, they can reduce soil erosion up on the hills. I mean, there's just, again, there's a lot of benefits that, you know, we all know the benefits, but I think it's good to hear uh, all those things that, that trees can do. This is actually uh, City Park looking towards uh, Dubuque Street, going out of town. Made flowers over to the right there. Then we have critters that enjoy. These critters sometimes can cause problems with our trees and other things. These guys love to eat bark. 
And they also love to eat twigs off of evergreens and then drop them down the ground and just kind of giggle at you when they do it. But, you know, it's part of the habitat. Um, just below that, you can see the, the woodpecker activity. There's a small hole there. Um, just below that with the woodpecker activity. So a lot of potential habitat there. Showed this one. This was a week or two ago. So spring is not far away. The robins are coming back. This was in a, um, a crab apple tree. They were just all kind of huddling up, trying to stay warm. And uh, they let me get kind of close. So you knew they were cold because they weren't going to fly too far. But then there's just that beauty. I mean, this just makes you want to get up in there and climb. Um, just, just a lot of beauty to trees, no matter what the size, uh, fall color, all kinds of characteristics that just the bark on that tree alone, that's a red oak, just, it's just got a neat quality to it. And again, I know the winter's been hard, but again, there was beauty with some of that ice and stuff if, after it uh, finally melted off. And, and this has been a hard winter on trees and us and everything else, but um, that's pretty neat. Again, you can see uh, up to the far right, there's some bending and breaking there, but uh, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse. You know, it, it was bad, but um, the one we had earlier in the year, I think the late spring one, it got warm at night, things kind of thawed before the winds came up. And this time, they, they talked about wind, but the wind never came up. If the wind would have came up in this last one, I think we would have really seen a lot of devastation. So, you know, thank our, our stars on that one. But it, it is beauty. Again, no matter what kind of trees, could be the bark, how the sunlight. The, the thing you got to think about, too, with trees, when you're selecting trees, if you select a tree for flowers, that flower is only going to last two weeks, maybe three tops. Does that tree have another characteristic, <laughs> be it the bark or be it the fruit or be it the form that, that shows up later in the year that gives you other characteristics to enjoy about that tree? Because, you know, you say, well, it looks great in the spring and then it's just blah the rest of the year. Well, sometimes those trees will have other characteristics that really make it look good in the landscape, too. This happens to be an aspen out by ACT. <clears throat> and I had to show some prairie um, just because we, we know we had woodlands in this area, but we had a lot of prairie, and, and there was a mix. Um, foresters here in Iowa, we say Iowa is a place where the prairie meets the trees, and it really is. This actually is out by ACT, a nice oak. Um, you see the sun dropping there in the west. Uh, but a beautiful oak with the prairie grass in front. That could be your backyard. All right. Well, if we're going to plant trees, it's really important to do it right. And I, I'm not going to get into that because I, I, I don't have time to talk about proper tree planting. But I'll give you one key factor with proper tree planting. Make sure you plant them green side up. That's really important. <laughs> and um, that's important. But it is important. There's, there's great literature from Iowa State University on proper tree planting. We're seeing a lot of improper planting out there that's causing problems in the landscape five or six, seven years later. A lot of trees are getting planted too deep. Sometimes they're in the pot too deep or in the burlap too deep accidentally, or they just get, I've seen people take trees that were kind of wobbly and just dig a deeper hole so they wouldn't wobble so much once they stuck them down in there. So, Look that information up and, and really look at that because proper planning is, is really important, but selection is, is where you got to start. <clears throat> if you do proper selection, you can avoid some problems. Um, a lot of times we don't think that that tree is going to grow, it's going to get bigger, but uh, those trees do get bigger. This is a white pine, and if you know anything about white pine, it wants to get 60 feet tall. I got one in my backyard, it's got a 25 foot spread already. My tree in my backyard would not fit there. Um, pretty soon I'll get a phone call from someone like this and they'll ask me, well, can I cut the top out so it just kind of makes a nice, you know. The thing is, you know, I said there's plants that fit almost every situation. This is probably pushing it, but there are dwarf conifers that 
If you want something that maybe will fit, there are a line of dwarf conifers out there that might fit in a situation like this if you really wanted something. So in almost every situation, there's something that fits. But before you know it, you know, it's going to be ripping the shingles off. And I always used to tell these stories. Now I carry my camera, I can actually show these pictures of, of things. You know, I'm just driving around when I see stuff like this. I'm like, all right, I have a slide presentation because I can actually show it. All right, some of the key things you need to think about when you're, when you're selecting plants and trees in general. <clears throat> Again, don't just go out there and say, I want to plant an oak in my front yard. Look at the site. Look at the soils. Is it well or, or poorly drained? And, and there's some things you can do. A lot of times, just dig in a hole, simple as pouring some water in there. And if it takes four days to, to dry out, I think you have poorly drained soils. Um, but just feel the texture. Is it sandy? Is it clay? Those kind of things. Because a lot of times when you look at the tags, it'll say prefers a, a moist, well-drained soil or can adapt to clay soils. All that information for you is out there once you start selecting those plants. But you have to investigate the site to see what do I have to work with and what's going to fit. Sun or shade. There are some plants that prefer, well, most Everything likes sun, but there are some plants that will grow in sun, but also fairly adaptive to shade. And there are a few plants that really don't like a lot of sun, especially if they're native trees or native smaller trees. We've got some like serviceberry and redbud that are woodland edge plants that like some protection, like a little shade. So know what you have. Do you have 50% of the day is it full sun or, you know, most of the day is it, is it shade? Know those kind of things because, again, on those tags, It'll say that plant prefers full sun, can adapt to a variety of shade, those kind of things. So that information is out there. And then the pH. Is the soil acidic or basic? And you can go to your extension office and take soil samples. They have little bags and method you can use and get some of this basic information. But there's a lot of plants. Basically, 7 is neutral. And most plants like things acidic, below 7, especially a lot of the trees. Not real below, but they don't like things real basic. And I'll show you some examples. There are some plants that if it's too basic, they'll, they won't adapt very well. They'll have some nutrient problems and some other problems that, again, if you know what your conditions are, you can avoid those problems ahead of time. Again, with all these precautions, you may do everything and plant a tree and it still may not grow because it's life. I mean, it's that's why I love my job because every day I don't know what's going to happen because we're dealing with the environment and people are probably the most challenged when it comes to plants and um, you know we just have to work with all those things. Location of utilities. Look up. You know, do you have wires close by? Because if you if you do, they may be clipping that tree in 15 years. <clears throat> You also have to call Iowa One Call, and I have a slide on that. But before you dig, you have to call Iowa One Call to know where all your underground utilities are. That is the law. And I've had people, you know, I've talked to and they said, well, I knew where everything was. I, I dug my hole, and then I didn't have a phone the next day. Even if you think you know where it's at, you're, you're required to call. Then once you evaluate all that stuff, you know, how much space do I have? What are the soil conditions? What's the drainage? Then you can start going, okay, what will fit in here? What kind of trees? I start going to websites. Iowa State has some websites. There's different selection materials. There's some great books here. Go out there and start saying, okay, well, this tree might fit, that tree might fit. But then you also need to think about what kind of characteristics do I want? Am I trying to promote wildlife? Do I want a big shade tree? Do I want an evergreen that's going to block, you know, my neighbor's boat or something, you know. What do you want from that tree? The other thing you need to think about is how big is that tree, what's its shape, and also what is it going to produce? Is it going to produce something that you don't want to sweep up? Uh, you know, walnuts. I'm actually going to talk about walnut. Not a bad shade tree, but it's probably not something you want in the front yard over the driveway. Um, you know, I had one guy call me and said, you know, Usually we don't sell trees in urban environments when it comes to logging and stuff. And he says, I have five walnut trees, and I'm tired of hitting my truck. Can you help me sell them? His, his whole thing was he just, I, I suggested that he just didn't park his truck there anymore, but he still wanted to sell them. 
And then plant diversity. We, we continue to have problems. I um, have a, a thing in the back on emerald ash borer. It's a new pest. Uh, it's coming out of Michigan. It's already in Illinois. It's killed 30 million ash trees in the United States already, and it's, it's running hard, and it's not going to stop. As we speak today, I can tell you that that pest has not been found in Iowa at this point, but that doesn't mean it's not here. It just hasn't been found. But, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had Dutch elm disease. And what did we do after we cut all those trees down? We planted green ash, silver maple, sugar maple, um, Norway maple, um, and, and a few other species. And now, in a lot of our communities, the average percentage of ash is over 20%. And so we really didn't learn from that. And hopefully from this, we'll continue. And, and diversity, even in your own yard, if you're planting three or four trees, Try to plant three or four different species if you can work it into your system, into your design. Because to me, I, I can tell you, with world trade, these problems will continue and they will never stop. And it goes both ways. We have shipped some stuff to China that have actually been very devastating to their pine trees. And so all over the world, this has caused problems when it comes to plant health. And I'll just tell you a really quick story with this stuff coming. I was at a, a meeting of specialists that deal with invasive plants and insects and stuff, and they said a couple years ago there was a company that, well, I'll just say they sell stuff, okay? And these boxes came in, and they opened them up, and it had an unusual insect in it. And the national headquarters told them to take the boxes outside, shake out the insects, and put the boxes back on the shelves. And this happened to be an invasive um, beetle on cedar trees that they introduced into the United States. So stuff like that is coming all the time. So again, diversity is, is one good defense to trying to reduce some of those challenges. Because most disease and insect problems are only specific to a particular group of trees. Like this ash problem right now, they're testing walnut and oak and all that, and that pest will not complete its life cycle on those other species. So if there's any one good thing, it's, it seems to be only attacking ash. This tends to be our urban environment. We take the good soil and then we come back and we put more soil on top and that good soil is usually just a couple inches. And um, I kind of got myself in trouble. I was taking pictures of this guy when they were doing this and he wanted to know, he saw my DNR truck, thought I was there investigating and everything, but I just told him, I was showing him what happens, you know, a lot. And this, again, our soils can, can be very difficult, especially in our urban areas or even if we're building a new house, a lot of times that soil gets compacted. And there's a gentleman that, uh, Mr. O'Leary, who's the uh, principal out at uh, Corville Elementary, Corville Central, thank you, uh, a great tree person. This guy is, I, I wish we had a lot more like him. Planted tons and tons of trees, and we were out one day. We were looking at these, and, and these are um, trees that were planted about 10 years before, I think he said, by him and his son. Planted on the same day, same size, same species. Four different ones, a lot of different growth there. So even in a could have been plant related, I mean the tree health themselves, but a lot of times I get on sites and even 20 feet apart that soil can change quite a bit in an urban environment. So you're just dealing with kind of a, a mess of stuff. You never know what you're going to get into. But I thought this was turned out to be an interesting picture. Um, A lot of times in these urban areas and stuff, too, the drainage isn't too good. And, and in this case, the tree just kind of floated out of the ground. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times in these environments, it's, it's like, um, you know, planting a tree in a big bathtub because it's just so compacted and stuff. In some cases, you might want to wait a year or two if you have a new environment. Go through the freezing and thawing. Let that soil kind of work back up before you, you know, go with a lot of trees. And we also have conflicts. Another conflict, this could be, it may not be the soil drainage, but a lot of times on these new sites, we have irrigation because of the grass. Trees and grass don't always, their needs aren't the same. So a lot of times we see trees that are just drowned because we're trying to keep the grass green, but we have to water it every day, and the trees only want that water, you know, every 7 to 10 days maybe, or over 14 days. 
So you, you got to think about those conflicts when you're, when you're dealing with it. There are species that might adapt to those conditions. Um, and I might show you, I'll show you one or two that that's, might adapt. Um, just the environment, I, I talked about soil conditions sometimes. This is a pen oak, um, and this is not a sunburst pen oak. This is a pen oak that's not healthy, and it's not healthy because the pH tends to be usually above 7, and iron becomes tied up when that pH gets basic, and that iron becomes unavailable to that tree. And there's a number of trees that this happens to. Um, happens to red maples, but it's not the same nutrient. It's uh, manganese, I believe, with those. But for some trees, if the pH gets too high, certain elements become unavailable, get tied up, and those trees cannot get those. If you tested that soil, there'd be plenty of iron there, probably. It's just not available to those trees. So again, there's certain plants like pen oak, red maple. If you're going to plant those trees, you may want to know what your soil conditions are like, know what the pH is to see if it's adapted. With pen oak, our general rule is as you go west in Iowa, you just don't plant pen oak. It, the pHs are, are pretty high as you go out to western Iowa. As you come east, they're better. But I can, in my dad's yard in Village Green, he used to have two pen oaks. He's got one now that's 40 feet tall, and the other one's been dead for 25 years. They were only 50 feet apart, but the soil conditions were different enough that one did well and one didn't. So knowing some of those conditions and, and knowing the desires or the needs of the plant you want to plant helps you avoid some of those problems. There are some solutions to this, but they're more Band-Aid solutions. So again, it's more trying to get the right tree in the right place. Don't do this, okay? <laughs> Simple as that. Um, think about how big that tree is going to get. This, this wasn't in Johnson County. This happened to be in Illinois. I was on a <laughs> soccer weekend and doing my walk and carrying my camera and giggling at the same time. And so yeah, I have a picture. Um, utility companies are going to have to prune this. They, they need protection around that line. They need to protect you. You know, we know how cold it's been and when the power goes out. That's not fun. So be kind to to the utilities because they, they really are trying to protect that line. Um, but if you plant too close, they will uh, do this to your tree. Okay? But believe it or not, that's good pruning. We're not talking about pruning today, but they actually prune that in a way that it doesn't sprout and the wounds that they made will actually close correctly and not get a lot of decay in them. It looks funny. You get your bagels and your V's and your C's and all kinds of funny funny things, but um, what they used to do is just come in and give them a, a haircut and then they'd sprout right back and they have to come back three or four years or two years later. Now when they do it, they actually only have to prune maybe every four or five years, so they're saving money. The bottom line is that tree's not in the right place. You know, the power line may have came afterwards, but these kind of things can be avoided. That's not in Johnson County either. You know, I'm picking on the other counties on the things that um, but again, that's why this is important. 1-800-292-8989. If that number's not right, you can find it. I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, you're required to call this number before you dig. You know, any kind of digging, not just for trees, but any kind of digging. It's really important that you call, call that number. All right. Again, like I said, once you find out how much space you have, start looking at the characteristics of the plant that you may want. You know, what kind of bark does it have? Is it the kind of bark that I want to see in my landscape? Some of the greatest places to go to see these things is arboretums. There's a good one in Dubuque. There's one in Clinton. There's the Iowa Arboretum south of uh, Ames. Uh, Ames now has the Ryman Gardens that has some plants. You know, go look at these plants that are 20, 30 feet tall and say, is that going to look right in my yard? You know, it may take it 15 years to get that big, but is that, you know, before you go do these things, kind of see what, what it's going to look like. See what the characteristics of the plant are. Is it going to produce some of this stuff? You know, I always get, well, that tree's messy. Well, find out why it's messy and see if you can deal with that mess. Um, or is that mess something like crab apple that you like because you want to attract birds or other wildlife? Um, same thing with the acorns. 
you know, it just depends. Again, you may not want walnuts over the house or over the driveway, but if you have a big backyard in the back that, you know, I'll talk about it, maybe a tree that, and actually those aren't walnuts, those are uh, buckeyes down there on the far right. <coughs> Think about the leaves. Sometimes they have characters. Uh, tulip poplar down there at the bottom, that has its own ornamental characteristic, looks like a tulip. Uh, the dark surface of the... Uh, Quercus bicolor, which is also swamp white oak. Again, ginkgo there on the right, buckeye down on the far right. Look at those characteristics and say, is that something I want in my yard? Okay, and like with honey locusts, some people like that because the leaflets fall off and they're not very messy. But I was down at, the, at um, Central one time when I was working in Iowa State doing a program and the janitor came up to me and just started Getting all mad, he says, I hate those honey locusts because those little leaves, every time they open the door, get sucked in like a vacuum, and I have to vacuum them up. So it's your perspective. I mean, You've got to think about, you know, how you look at those things, if, if you like it or you don't like it. Fall color. Um, you know, what are those characteristics? And again, just kind of like, I, I didn't give flowers, but same thing with flowers. They can be very variable. I mean, you, you get the plant for that reason. Some years it's real good. Some years it's not so good. It, it varies from year to year. Same thing with flowers and stuff. But you can find out what those characteristics are and, and see if that's something that you might like. And that's important, though, to know what the characteristics are so you don't plant a hawthorn right across the sidewalk like this here. That's not a very good thing. It's not a good safety factor. All right, so again, think about what the plan has and is it going to fit in your landscape? All right, this is where diversity comes in. This is um, in Michigan. All those trees are dead. Those are ash trees. They just haven't been cut down yet, okay? So that pest is very devastating. With that said, I don't think the world's going to end. It's not here yet. Uh, if it does show up in Iowa, it could be spotty. It's, it's not necessarily going to come in and wipe everything out right away. Uh, but where it's been, the problem they had in Michigan was they think the plant or the insect was there since 1990, and they didn't figure it out until 2002. So it sat around for 12 years just killing things before they really figured out what was happening. So it can be pretty devastating. So even in your own backyard, the more diversity you can plant, multiple trees, multiple species, the better off you are, okay? All right, so some th trees to avoid. Again, this is just, um, there is a publication in the back, Johnson County, uh, there was a group of folks that came up with a recommended list. I do not like lists. Dr. Isles from Iowa State doesn't either because to me it's already outdated. There could be problems of what we put on here. So you have to take these lightly, but it's just a, a nice little list that talks about some plants that might adapt. With that, there's a lot of cultivars of some of those plants that would adapt too. Um, a number of them are native, and I'm not going to get in the native, non-native argument today, because that, that could go a whole hour too. The thing I'm going to tell you is I'm going to list some plants that aren't native, and I look at it more from an invasive aspect. If those plants won't get in our natural woodlands and stuff, or don't spread, or seedless. The, the, again, the problem with our environment is it's changed so much, even though we take a native tree, it's hard for that native tree to grow in cement, you know, for planting trees in a very tough environment. So I praise native trees, but a lot of times our environment that we're planting in is not native. So it's tough. So there are some non-native plants that will fit the need too. And even with our native plants, a lot of times you don't know where they're coming from if they're truly native to, it's not like prairie seed. Prairie seed, a lot of times you can get native prairie seed in Johnson, from Johnson County. Trees, you can't do that. Okay. Scotch pine. This is the easy one for me. If you have scotch pine in your yard, I'm sorry. Um, don't cut them down if they're alive. But there is a disease called pine wilt that's very devastating and, and wiping out a lot of our scotch pine. Um, it's caused by a little nematode. Scotch pine was used for years. Our state nursery, we still sell it because we grow it for Christmas trees. And usually this problem doesn't show up for 15 to 20 years on the trees till they get bigger. So we still sell them because you cut a Christmas tree at seven to eight years. 
but it's a good reason not there, there's a number of other disease problems with this with this tree too so I would I would uh, stay away from scotch pine this one's gonna get me in trouble and that's okay Norway maple um, is used a lot it's a nice tree but um, and there's green varieties and purple varieties a lot of times the purple variety people call that a red maple but it's usually a crimson king or what they call a Schwedler Norway maple this is my dad's yard and he still calls it his red maple even though I've proven to him by paper that it's not a red maple he'll giggle and say Mark I'm going out to work on my red maple and I know it's trees talking about but it's not it's a Norway um, but on the East Coast, Norway maple is becoming very invasive in our woodlands. It's actually outcompeting the native sugar maple. Um, so it's causing a lot of problems from an invasive standpoint. If you're in the deep town and not near a woodland, maybe you could still plant this. Or if you have a variety that doesn't produce as much seed or doesn't produce seed, maybe. But I'm very hesitant. There's, there's actually a place by uh, Hawkeye Carver Arena where there was one planted it's actually invaded part of that woodland by cover it's I mean there's stems every three inches it's just taken over the understory of the woodland so it can be very invasive and that's that's my concern about Norway all ash species <clears throat> they're all susceptible now when I say all ash I'm not talking about mont mountain ash the mountain ash won't be on my list today because it doesn't do that well here either but if you have a mountain ash, the emerald ash borer will not hurt it, okay? So that's a good thing. Um, but green ash, purple ash, and which purple is just a variety of white ash, uh, black ash, uh, green, what, everything, it, this pest will attack. So, and actually I've been recommending this for a number of years since we knew about this pest that for now I, I would hold off on planting ash trees. Now if you planted one three years ago, gave it to your mom for Mother's Day, who knows what's going to happen. That pest, it could be 15 years before it comes. I mean, just don't go out and cut trees because something could happen. We, we don't know what's going to happen. If you got room to plant something else, maybe do that. I have a 26-inch ash in my front yard. I plant in a burrow right next to it. So just in case something happens. Uh, red choke cherry, a Schubert cherry. It's got a number of different names. It's a beautiful tree in the landscape, but it's got this disease down on the bottom right called black knot rot. It looks like your dog's been up in the tree, and it's, it's, not, it's pretty devastating to the plants. The only time you see it is in the winter. In the summer, you can't see it on the tree, but it can be pretty devastating um, to the plants. So I, I would think about avoiding. It's, it's too bad because it's, it's one of those small trees that has that reddish purple color that there's just not a lot of those varieties. There's a few varieties of crab apple that have that color, but not to the same tense as that. Paper birch. Um, paper birch is native to Iowa, but it's really native to northeast Iowa, up where it's kind of cool and, and not so warm, prefers north slopes, east slopes, where it's cooler. If you plant paper birch, um, just plan on in 15 years to have a firewood sale or to have a nice ornament on your fireplace. There's, there's a pest um, called the bronze birch borer that because our summers get too warm, too hot, it, it really stresses the trees and a lot of times bronze birch borer will get paper birch. There are some new selections out there that are supposed to be more tolerant and stuff like that but it, it's hard for them to tolerate our kind of warmer summers here. Unless you have a real kind of cool north slope, um, I won't get too excited about it. Austrian pine, you can still find this once in a while, um, but it has a number of diseases. Down on the far right, there's a needle disease and a shoot blight that gets that. And once that tree starts producing cones, it becomes very susceptible uh, to this disease. So it can be pretty devastating. Bradford pear, it's a type of ornamental pear. And I will talk about, there are some ornamental pears out there that you can plant. But this is one that was planted for years, kind of another one of those replacement for elm. But if you look down on the far right, they have very weak connections when, they're, when they grow, and they're very susceptible to ice and snow. And um, usually they get nice, big, and beautiful, and you love them, and then they break in half. But there are some varieties out there now, or selections, with stronger branch angles that will have the same characteristics, 
but will be a lot less susceptible to, to damage. So there are some alternatives. Okay, something to think about uh, cautioning when you plant. Colorado blue spruce. I would not plant this plant as a windbreak. We have a disease and up on the far left here, there's a needle cast disease that can be very devastating. This is one of those trees that if you plant in the landscape, there's a good chance in 15, 20 years, you're gonna be spraying a fungicide twice every spring to prevent this disease. Or once it's there to kind of try to keep that tree healthy. Now, if you have one just ornament and you want to try it as a selective plant, you know, you could still think about it. Good air circulation and those kind of things are beneficial. But as a windbreak, you're going to get a much denser planting, and that's going to really promote that disease. So I would avoid using a lot of these. Um, but if, again, if we tell you not to plant everything, we would, our list would be really short. So again, I, I would use some caution with this, and I, and I definitely would avoid it as a windbreak tree. Hybrid maple. One of the selections used a lot is autumn blaze. Again, this is one I would caution, and the reason I caution, if you look down on the far bottom, this is one that it's got a lot of silver. It's a cross between silver maple and red maple. Silver maple usually doesn't have a fall color, so it's got the red fall color of, of red maple, and it's got the fast growth of silver maple. So it grows really fast, but it has poor branch structures down there in the bottom right. So they're very susceptible to wind and ice, but if they're pruned and maintained, you can get rid of some of that and, and develop them. But I, I would be somewhat cautious with them because we're planting a lot of them. Every time we get a new one, we just we want to plant a lot of it. and uh, Sometimes we can overdo it. Red maple. I would be very cautious with this plant of, of where you place it, where you use it. Um, these are doing very well. These are out in eastern Johnson County in a development. Beautiful fall color. Um, some years they're really burgundy, really rich, and just, you know, I'll get tons of calls. What are those red trees over here, over there? I want to plant one. And the thing I'm seeing, though, in the last, you know, just in my observations, I'm seeing a lot of stress trees. Now, this one's in a very tough environment, but I had another picture in someone's front yard, pretty good grass, pretty good area, a lot of room to grow. I, I just see a lot of dieback. I see some relation to the pH. I, I just see, I don't see a lot of healthy, healthy red maples in the landscape. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it. So I would be really cautious, and I would look at the environment that, they like good, moist, cool conditions. I, I wouldn't put it on a south, southwest exposure where it's really dry. River birch. Um, this is where river birch likes to grow, down along a drainage where it's nice and moist, okay? But it doesn't like to grow up in the front yard in a nice dry area. Maybe if the pH is too high, this is one that gets sensitive to. This is one that's kind of yellow. This is, again, in, a, in an area that's just not very happy. I kind of fell in this trap when I worked at Iowa State, and, and I think others did too. You know, people would call and say, I want to plant a birch, but I heard I can't plant paper birch. And everyone said, well, plant river birch. It's a great, it's native, yada, yada, yada. But we didn't say it likes moist, wet conditions. It should be down along a drainage. It grows native on the river bottom. It doesn't grow on a dry upland. And, and that's, that's one of the concerns that you have to look at. So river birch, I would be cautious. Beautiful, though, clump birch, nice bark characteristics, great winter characteristics. Little leaf linden, um, we just plant a lot of this. That's why I put it on the cautious. But also, I'm going to have another linden on one that's done fairly well. Um, but if you know about Japanese beetle, Japanese beetle love lindens. And the last couple of years up by Kirkwood and up in those areas, the lindens have just been, look like you stood on them with a torch in the summer, and they're just brown because those, the Japanese beetle just defoliate them. It's one of their favorite plants for some reason. Um, it won't kill them, but you're going to have an ugly tree in your yard when that beetle comes. So even, I'm going to mention uh, linden, on the other list, it's, they've done well, but again, I would be cautious because that pest, it's moving into Johnson County. It's been here for a while, but we haven't seen it get to the population size where we're really seeing it just go kind of crazy like it has up around Cedar Rapids and other areas. 
All right. What's done well? Sugar maple's done pretty good. Sugar maple has some disease problems. Sugar maple are a large shade tree. You know, they can get, oh wow, 60, 70 feet tall. Can have a 30, 40 foot spread. Sometimes a beautiful um, fall color. This is right off of Market Street on the corner there, I think, where it turns into one way. This was just a, a beautiful tree. Um, Summit Street, there's some great sugar maples. There is a disease called verticillium wilt that these trees are susceptible to, and we do see some in town, but it, it, it's a good tree. Um, it's done pretty well in this area. Uh, it's a native species. It's one of those two that, let's say you've got a tree that, you know, you think it only has five or 10 years to go and you got a spot where you can plant a tree that's got a lot of shade. This is one you could underplant with. It's shade tolerant, it would work its way up until you remove that other tree. You know, there's a lot of trees you can't do that with, but it's one you could kind of fill in a space if you were trying to um, help, something else, help something else out later. Honey locusts. Um, some people like this tree, some people don't, but it's done well in the landscape. Down on the far bottom is a winter picture. It, it's just got a nice branch. It's got some good characteristics that way. Again, it's got the smaller leaves. Um, the native has seed pods and thorns, but the selections do not. There's a lot of selections. There is a pest out there called mimosa webworm that with our milder winters is starting to show up more, so you may see some problems with it. it. Again, it's a pest that won't kill the tree, but I think this tree has a place in the landscape. It, it also has diffused, let, it lets sunlight come through, so if you want grass, it will let some grass grow underneath that tree, even though I would tell you that it's better not to have the grass there for the tree, but if you want the grass, this tree will let it grow. You know, they, some of these trees can get, again, 50, 60 feet tall, pretty good spread, 25, 30 feet. These are general numbers, you know. If you look in the book, you can get the exact measurements. American Linden, uh, another name for this is native basswood. This actually, um, these trees can get huge in diameter. There's some around town that, I mean, they're like 23, 24 inches in diameter. You need a pretty good space. There's some cultivars, though, that are a little more compact. If you don't have as big of an area, you don't want them to spread out. Um, Again, the Japanese beetle, though, I'll caution you, might be a threat to this, will be a threat to this plant, um, especially from an aesthetic standpoint. The one challenge with this tree is it gets older. It, it does get hollow, and, and so it, it's just a characteristic of, of lindens. They, they tend to get big and hollow as they get older, so it could become a problem later on in the landscape, especially as a street tree. All right, red oak. Um, I think that fits that yard nice. It's going to get a, you know, red oak will get, again, 50, 70 feet tall, probably 30, 35 foot spread. They can have a nice fall color. Again, though, it produces something. It produces a nut. You may not want that. Um, hopefully these people will want that falling, you know, in 20 years when those nuts are falling on the roof. Again, you need to think about those. Some people, you know, they're like, I'll let the squirrels take care of it. We don't care. But other people, may not like it. So again, but I, I, you know, we always talk about oaks, oh, they don't grow very fast, whatever. These things will grow two feet a year. Um, and so they can make a decent shade tree. There is a threat, oak wilt, which is caused by a fungus. It's always a threat. Uh, you can slow that disease down or prevent it from not pruning uh, in the summertime, only pruning your oak trees in the wintertime. So there's some things you can do. Again, just because there's a threat, it doesn't mean I wouldn't plant some of these trees. Okay. Again, that's where the diversity thing comes in. And if you want one tree that's not going to have a problem, I would go to your Betula plasticiata, and that'd be your best <laughs> one. Another oak, white oak. This is in Johnson County, big monster tree. You can't even see the house. I mean, that's just awesome. Most of us don't have a yard that big, though. So again, you need to think about how much room you have available. Talking about leaving a legacy, I mean, that, that tree's been around a long time, and it's going to be around a long time. That probably was not planted. Mr. or Mrs. Squirrel probably planted that tree, and thanks to them, we have that. Um, but uh, white oaks, I mean, that tree there probably has a 70-foot spread. Just gigantic. You know, they tend to round off in the top, though, and not get as tall. Maybe 
sometimes 50, 60 feet tall, um, but they have a huge spread. This is the one I showed you earlier. This is a white oak uh, over by City High. Um, I like their fall color. They have a purple fall color. Again, produce an acorn, though, so you may not like that. Uh, so you need to think about those characteristics. But I, I think they're kind of a neat tree. Not real fast growing, but uh, they do pretty well. Pin oak, this is one that has pH problems and other problems, but on the right soils, you know, I've, I've just, I look around and I see a lot of nice pin oaks. I see some that aren't so good, but I, I see quite a few that are doing pretty well. Um, again, oak wilt's a potential threat. Has a nice fall color, has a smaller acorn. It's about the size of the nail on your pinky or maybe your ring finger, so it's not as big of an acorn. But it likes to produce a lot of them, so if you don't like walking on marbles in the fall, it may not be something you got to be careful there. Um, but they're just kind of a neat tree. The, the one thing with pin oaks, though, they have these branches that will droop down normally. As they get older, though, they kind of lose that characteristic sometimes, uh, like this one has a little bit. But it's one of those that you'll have to deal with from a landscape situation, too. Maybe one you'll have to prune up if you want clearance. The, you know, so you got to think about those things, too. Just hitting the oaks here. I have to. I live in Iowa City. There's a lot of neat oaks. Uh, Burr oak. This is up by Manville Heights. There's a lot of neat oaks up there. There is some oak wilt up in that neighborhood, but I mean, just look at that. This is in the fall, so that tree doesn't look as healthy. It is healthy. It's just the leaves were starting to uh, kind of turn colors and stuff, but just a, a monster tree. Burr oaks get that flatter look to them a little bit a lot of times too, but really wide. A lot of times, you know, they can get up to 40, 50 feet wide or wider, probably in that 60 to 70 foot range. Not super fast, but I've seen bur oaks grow a foot, foot and a half a year, um, which isn't that bad. Ginkgo, not a native tree, but uh, is done well in Johnson County and in a lot of places. Seems to tolerate urban environments <coughs> pretty well. I did see something downtown on them this year. I think most of them came out of it, and I don't know what's going on yet, so I've been watching that. But in general, we don't see a lot of pest problems. They have kind of an open crown. They're real slow growing, though. Um, they're not very fast. Very slow growing, I heard out there. Um, but they have kind of a yellow fall color, and most of the ones available are supposed to be fruitless. So the ones that have fruit do not smell good. Um, and all those in the University of Iowa have now been removed because of different things, but uh, not, not a bad tree in the landscape. Can get fairly tall though, at least 50 feet, I've seen them bigger. Not real wide, there's some upright varieties. There's one in the Ped Mall I think is a more columnar variety that, that's probably only gonna get 15, 20 feet wide, but there's others that'll get 30, 35 feet wide. All right. I'm going to go a little over, but we're doing okay. Small trees. Redbud. Um, I like this tree. Uh, I used to work in Oklahoma. It was a state tree in Oklahoma. It, it likes east-facing slopes, though, or east sides, north places, places that are cooler. It's, it's kind of a, in our native woodlands, it's a woodland edge plant. So it's not going to like a hot south, southwest side of the building. But you can see down here that a lot of times they can be multi-stem, some single stem, kind of have a spreading effect. There's some neat ones on the Iowa State campus that are kind of breaking apart and laying down and growing. I mean, just some really neat ornamental characteristic. Have grape flowers, again, don't last very long, but that purplish maroon, have a heart-shaped leaf. They do produce a little pod, though. Could be good, could be bad. Um, but, but a neat tree, probably in that 20 to 25 foot range as far as height. Pretty good spread. I've seen them, you know, at least 20 feet. Service berry, another native woodland uh, plant. Likes woodland edges, cool sites. So again, east, northeast kind of sides or aspects. Um, nice fall color. Has an edible fruit um, that it produces. Birds love them. There are some varieties. This one spreads more. I've seen a lot of the varieties I've seen are more upright. They do have a nice white flower. Uh, in the springtime. Some deer people love deer love them. Okay. Japanese tree lilac. This is a tree that gets so oh, 30 to maybe 40 feet tall. Um, 
A lot have been planted in the Iowa City area. The neat thing about Japanese tree lilac is it's, it's a lilac, <clears throat> big flowers, but it flowers later in the summer, in June. So when everything else, a lot of the other plants have stopped flowering, it shows up in the landscape. And, you know, very ornamental. Produces the, the lilac <coughs> pods and that. But uh, again, in that probably 30 foot range, probably a 25 foot spread. I've seen a few a little bigger, but nice plant. I've seen it do well. Crab apples. I have to mention this because I'm a friend of Dr. Jeff Files. He's Mr. Crab Apple. <clears throat> and the reason I show this is there's, there's like gajillion selections of crab apple. I mean, just all kinds, different flower types, different fruit types, shape, sizes, anywhere from eight feet tall up to 25 feet tall. Some that look like brooms coming out, some that are flat, round. I mean, almost every size, shape you want, you can find a crab apple. The thing that's important, though, you need to get some that are disease tolerant or disease resistant. There's a disease called apple scab, and on the right, you'll get a scabby apple or scabby crabby apple if you, if you get one that's susceptible. But there's good um, selections out there that are more uh, or less susceptible to that disease. So really good selections out there. So crab apple. A few conifers. Showed you the Norway spruce. Probably one of the faster growing conifers. They get, uh, boy, these things can get 60, 70, 80 feet tall. They can get huge. Got the big hanging cones, very pendulous cones on them. Very ornamental. The branches are kind of pendulous. Um, this thing in my backyard has got at least a 25 foot spread, and that tree was planted in 62. Okay. I didn't plant it, but thankfully the person that bought the house and built the house did plant it. So I am enjoying it because of that. White pine. Here on the left is probably a 15-year-old white pine, and on the right is one that's probably 40 or 50 years old. They're very compact when they're young, but as they get bigger, they have branches that are like catcher mitts. And so when you get ice on them, they snap, so you get a more say ornamental look as they get bigger because <laughs> the branches break off. But it, I don't think it's not necessarily a reason not to plant it, but they will lose branches. I mean, I was praying a lot during the ice storms because I had branches of my white pine that were one inch from the power line and it's crossing my fingers. And when the utility guys came, I actually jumped out and they did a little extra pruning and we won't have that problem next time. So, but tree can get rather large. Again, like the um, spruce, very fast growing, very fast growing. Sounds like we're going to be calling dogs in here with the whistles. A few other quick species, and then I'll finish up and we can take a break and we'll answer some questions. Swamp white oak. Um, this is one I'd be somewhat cautious. I've seen some um, soil problems with pH with swamp white oak, but they're kind of a neat tree. They are native to Iowa. They grow down in the native kind of bottom lands though, more moist conditions. Um, have neat bark characteristics. They have a flaky bark here on the left, have a real shiny top leaf, and then the underside, it's called Quercus bicolor. The underside's kind of white, so it's a good characteristic. Then they also have a stalked acorn, which is kind of unique. There's not a lot of species with stalked acorns. But swamp white oak um, falls in that probably 50 to 60, 70 foot range. Um, probably at least a 30-foot spread. Shagbark hickory, not something you think about planting, but kind of a neat landscape tree, especially with the bark characteristics, if you got a bigger backyard or a bigger area. But I live off of Friendship, and this morning coming over, there's three shagbark hickories within the right-of-way. They look okay, but I'm sure in the fall it's not that pleasant. With, they, they produce a very large nut. Um, so you've got to have them in the right place. They've, they've planted some uh, on the university campus that are coming. So a lot of times these native selections are harder to find in the, in the nurseries, but some nurseries are starting to grow more native plants. Kentucky coffee tree, I think, is one to look at. It's another native um, tree. You can get, I think, 50 to 70 feet tall, probably more in the 50 to 60. Have neat bark characteristics. It's, it's kind of flaky, not like birch, but it's kind of flaky. They have a leaf, though. The leaf, one leaf, is like this big. It's huge. It's got little leaflets. 
So everything you see down the bottom are little leaflets, but the leaf is, is just gigantic. Um, they do produce a pod, but I think there are some selections that, are, that do not have the pods. Um, not a real fast grower, and in the wintertime, it looks like a tree from Creature Feature back when I was a kid. It's just got these really thick stems. It's just got kind of a gnarly, I think, cool look, but it, it, even in the winter landscape, it's got some character. A few more. Ornamental pear. There are some newer selections of ornamental pear that have nice white flowers. You see the fruit. It's like a little crab apple down there in the bottom. Um, they have kind of a purplish fall color. But this has a lot wider branch angles here, some of these newer selections out there. So check with the nurseries. Check with Iowa State and others. There are some selections out there that, that are stronger and are not going to break up like the Bradford pears. But go to Dogwood, another native one that is native in our woodlands, uh, fits well in a corner of a yard, a corner of a house, in that 10 to probably 20 foot range. It has a very layered effect though, just a neat, I didn't take a great picture of the layer effect, but they have a really neat layering effect, has some fall color. Our only native tree dogwood in Iowa. We have native dogwood, they're shrubs, but this is our only native tree dogwood. Um, but it likes that northeast exposure, not a south, southwest. A couple others, uh, concolor fir. Could be a substitute for spruce or blue spruce. Has a really blue color to it. I'll give you some caution though, like some moist, well-drained soils. Um, I've seen kind of mixing effects with it. If you have a site that's very variable, I'll see some really good ones. Then I'll see some not so good ones. So it, but it, but it is an alternative. Um, it's got a softer needle than the blue spruce. It won't bite you or scratch you when you touch it. Um, probably can get. I've seen them, you know, reach at least 50, 60 feet tall. Probably 20, 30 foot spread. Interesting plant. Larch. Uh, European larch is what you see a lot. There's a native larch called tamarack. This is on the Iowa campus. There's some really neat ones on the Iowa campus. This, this plant is neat too because it's deciduous, meaning that it looks like an evergreen, but it sheds its needles in the fall. So all those needles fall off. Um, they're kind of yellow though, and they're kind of bright, and so they're somewhat ornamental. Uh, in the springtime, they're kind of have a real bright green for a couple weeks, and it's kind of ornamental too. They're just a I mean, that's just cool. I mean, it's like a big bonsai tree. Um, do fairly well in Iowa. Um, unique plants. Bald cypress. This is the one that you would put in that planting hole that was completely wet. Uh, this is actually City Park. 1993, Terry Robinson and Great Wisdom, after the floods, planted some bald cypress. And this, these are how big they are now since 1993. They're awesome. They've had to put uh, wire around them so the beaver don't cut them down um, <laughs> to protect them. And, uh, but it's kind of unique. This is another deciduous conifer. They will shed their needles. That's their fall color, kind of a reddish, brownish color. Um, unique plant in the landscape. They do produce a, a cone that's like a little ball. It's kind of unique. Um, I've, there's a really neat one clear up in Ames on the campus at Iowa State near Curtis Hall. If any of you like Iowa State, probably not. But anyway, there's even some neat ones that far north. So it's, it's an alternative in the landscape, okay, in the right conditions. I wouldn't go out again and plant a ton of them. But again, there are plants out there that we can use. I had to show this one. I just love sycamore. But it's got some pretty major disease problems. It's got a disease called anthracnose. But you just gotta love that bark. I mean, just all year round, that whitish model brown bark. I just love it, love it, love it. Um, and they're huge. I mean, they just, I just they're awesome trees. Um, but people hate them. They're messy. They drop this, they do that. They're dropping twigs all year round. Well, probably not gonna find this in a nursery anymore. Um, but there is a selection or a cross or hybrid called London Plane Tree that doesn't have as much challenges with the disease called anthracnose. And this is actually a, a street tree up in Cedar Rapids. Bark is very similar, leaves are very similar, produces a fruit that hangs from the tree, 
Um, so it does produce something, but is an alternative. It's fairly tolerant to that disease. All right, one, two more. Silver maple. I think it's a plant we can still plant. If you have a huge backyard that's wet and moist, and it can get very large, it's an alternative. It really is. Again, if we're thinking diversity, and we're thinking, you know, we've planted a lot of silver maple in our, I wouldn't recommend it as a street tree, but in the right conditions, it doesn't have tons of disease and insect problems. Its biggest fault is it grows very fast and susceptible to ice and snow. But, you know, that tree's probably only 40 years old. They can grow very fast, you know, maybe 50, okay? But they can get pretty big pretty quick. So in the right place, train correctly. They can, I've seen silver maple that are pruned correctly that don't have 45 stems coming from one spot. So they can be maintained and trained, okay? So again, I'm thinking diversity. And black walnut in the right place could be a shade tree. Now again, in the right place. This is on the Iowa campus. This thing is a monster. It's got lightning rods in it. It's been struck, yada, yada, yada. I mean, but it is awesome. It's a big, huge tree. It's time for cookies and stuff like that. I went a few minutes over, but this is Johnson County, Johnson County Fairgrounds. Nice sunset in the backdrop. Been a great audience. I'll be back in a few minutes when she announces and everything, and we'll answer some of your questions. Thank you. Can you talk about cottonwood trees? Are there males and females? Is it illegal to plant them? It is no longer illegal to plant cottonwoods. At one time, there was a, a state ordinance or whatever that said that you could make your neighbor cut their cottonwood down if it produced cotton because it was a nuisance. That is no longer on there, so you can't do that. I actually had to go out when I worked at Iowa State with Dr. Paul Ray, who's been here before, and we actually had to sex a tree because the neighbor wanted the other neighbor to cut it down. And it was more of the Joneses versus whoever. He just wanted to make his neighbor mad, and he found out that was a way. Um, cottonwood is a native plant. It it's, grows on the bottom lands. It's a huge tree. It's probably the fastest. I think it's the fastest. Um, tree in North America as far as a uh, deciduous tree. It's, there's nothing, it's, it can be a little weaker wooded because of that, but you would need a huge area to plant cottonwood because they're just monster trees, but they are neat, very fast growing. I mean, you can have a tree this big, could be 60, 70 years old, and that's it. I mean, they're very fast growing. They have a nice big leaf that's kind of shimmering in the, they're, they're actually related to um, aspens. So, so they are a nice tree, but you would need a huge area. We actually plant them. We do some plantings along what we call riparian buffers, along streams and rivers, and we still put cottonwood in that mix. But there are, what most people get when they get poplar, a lot of times that has cottonwood in it. It's, it's a variety of cottonwood or a hybrid with cottonwood in it, and it's usually a seedless variety because it does better in, you know, so you don't have cotton in an urban environment. Did I answer most of that? Yeah, you okay. did. We had three, actually three questions involving the cottonwood tree. I was just making okay. sure that you had. Would you consider it advisable to plant that tree in an urban setting then? If you were... No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, this person, and that's, this may be some. Unless it was like City Park. I mean, they've got some big cottonwoods down along there. And again, it's got to be in the right place. So in the right place, yes, but. It, it would not be a tree I would plant on friendship between the street and the sidewalk. And right. No. Okay. 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 This person says, we live just above Coralville Reservoir at the bottom of a long one-half mile and steep northwest-facing slope. The old cottonwood trees along the old road, or along our road, are dying old from old age. Any suggestions for replacing them? Fir oak. White oak, red oak, some of the ones I mentioned, I think, in my talk would all be potential. Um, you know, if they want something that's a little faster, trying that London plane tree or something like that, too. Okay. It's, it's shaded and steep with native woods around, but does that make a difference? Oh, I didn't hear that part. Yeah. I just uh, heard that northwest. Was, but that came next. Okay, <laughs> that came next. Okay. 
Um, if it's fairly shady, um, that's where I would look at things like the American linden, which is, which is also our native basswood, which is shade tolerant, and something like the sugar maple. I mean, if it's fairly shaded, why are you laughing? Well, because then the next sentence says. <laughs> well, you're supposed to say it all before you get the answer. Uh, the next sentence says, please underline, no more sugar maples. Okay. <laughs> And no silver maples. No silver maples. Um, <laughs> That's all. If the cottonwoods are going to go and it's going to open and you're going to get that sunlight, I would look at those. But there's, there's, there's not a lot of shade tolerant trees out there available that do, you know, that, that we just have that are available that are going to be bigger trees. So, would a hemlock work there? <clears throat> hemlock would work if you want a tree that's you know, not going to get very big. Again, it's one of those that I probably would have put on, I don't know if I would have put it on any list. Um, I've seen some hemlocks in the county that have done very well, especially if they're shaded, if they want more of a screen, but it's not something that's going to be a shade tree. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. You can beat me up later, whoever that is at the end. Sorry. Will our colder, snowy, or winter help limit diseases and in insects this year? Let's cross our fingers. Um, <clears throat> We've had a number, I don't think it's going to usually have, winters have much effect on diseases and funguses and stuff, but I do think they have effect on some of the insects. Like one of the insects that really has done well the last couple uh, years because of the milder winters is one called bagworm. Now I'm not talking the big web worms. A lot of people call those bagworms. I'm talking about the little bagworms that hang from mostly the evergreens. When they defoliate them, they take the needles and they make their little bag. Um, they have, they were common in southern Iowa, down in Missouri, Oklahoma, way south. But as <clears> our <throat> summer, our winters have got milder, they've really pushed up. I find them clear up by Solon now. And when I first came here in 2000, I didn't find them north of 80. I just didn't. And they're a pest that uh, really likes um, evergreens and they sneak up on you. I mean they'll kill that tree in three or four years once the population gets big enough. But they can be managed if you're watching for them. The other one is the mimosa webworm that I was talking about. I think it's moving north too. So I'm hoping this winter will set some of those back. But for diseases usually I don't see a huge impact um, on cold. <laughs> it's been a great winter. I, I, I love it. I, I grew up in Iowa City, and when I was a kid, I used to shovel snow with my dad when he was plowing, and this is what it was like. And yeah, we really I, I know some it. days, like today when I was picking the ice, I thought, you know, it'd be nice for spring to come too, but it's been awesome. I have some very sad-looking arborvitae because of the winter weather. Is there anything I can do to help them repair their shape? Could they be staked up to keep them upright? A lot of arborvitaes will do that, especially with the ice and snow load, and you could take some nylon or something and try to bring them up, something softer. I mean, but that's just a Band-Aid. I mean, you're just, just so they don't look like this, I understand. Um, but you could try to tie them up. But I would use something that's soft that's not going to rub into those branches. Because I've seen people take wire and cord and things, and then it starts to rub those. But they're always going to... The minute you cut that, they're just going to go like this again. So you're going to have to keep it there. But if it's something you like in the landscape and you can do it, you could do that. But I would use something soft. Do you find red bud are short-lived? Um, I would say they're in that 30 to 40 year range. But again, I think a lot of it depends on the landscape. I think if they're in a protected site, that's where they're going to do best. Um, when I was taking pictures and stuff, if I found good ones, they were usually on the east or north facing, you know, side of the house. They weren't on the south, southwest. I do see their um, survivability very variable. I mean, again, I think they're a neat plant, but I see them do real well sometimes, and I see others that struggle. The other thing that they struggle with is they do not like yard chemicals. A lot of red buds will go like this because of some of the herbicides and stuff that we use in our landscape. Um, they're, they're a good indicator that somebody has sprayed something because they, one whiff, they go like this and they cup and curl. So they can struggle sometimes because of that. But um, I would put them in that middle ground. I wouldn't call them a long-lived. And, and they don't, 
you know, some of the biggest red buds I've ever seen are only like that big in diameter. But a lot of times they end up multi-stemmed, um, and they're somewhat susceptible to breakage. So sometimes people will have to cable and brace them to kind of keep them together. But they're, they're a unique plant. I had one coming up on the side of my house, but it just came up too close. So I actually had to cut it down because it was going to grow too close to the house. But if I could have, I would have moved it somewhere else. I think this year, you have something? Why did you decide not to do it? Um, because it was underneath in a point where I couldn't dig it up. <laughs> Question was yes. for TV land, why didn't I move it? Um, they, don't transplant well, they? they don't transplant well is one yeah. thing, but it was just in a bad situation where I couldn't have dug it up. Okay. But if I could have, I would have. It was one of those actually before I owned the place had been cut off many times. And so I think it had a very big kind of multi-stem. Okay. This is about the emerald ash borer. It, uh, this person says uh, they're, is the, they're concerned about whether the linden is in the ash family or if you, could, if you would plant an, an, a linden instead of an ash. The, the linden is not in the ash family. So the, as far as we know now, the... Okay. But I, I will repeat again, I, I think the Japanese beetle will make the lindens look, well, I know they will. The thing I'm seeing in Cedar Rapids, though, is the wave came through the Japanese beetle, was very devastating for a couple of years, and then the population is kind of spread out. So some of those trees I saw a couple of years ago that looked like they were torched and brown aren't looking like that anymore. So I'm hoping that it kind of goes through, because just a couple of years ago, the wave went through the Quad Cities and over by... Um, the Bentendorf exit and stuff, there was these nice big brown trees in July, but they were alive, but they, they just don't look, they don't look inviting. But uh, no, that, as far as we know, emerald ash borer will only attack ash trees. Okay. What about hackberry trees? I Great struggle. bark, nice shape, excuse me. Okay, go ahead. Great bark, nice shape. This person Great likes bark, nice trees. shape. Okay. Um, actually, I had it in my slide presentation all the way up till this morning. <laughs> and um, I pulled it out. Um, I think hackberry is a good tree. With that said, I've seen some environmental stresses and some different things with it about the last five years. It's just not doing as well as it had been doing. It has some insect problems that, to me, are just superficial. It's get these little galls on the bottom of the leaves. Don't hurt the tree at all. But the last couple of years, we've seen them leaf out, look pretty good, and then all of a sudden they lose a lot of their leaves. So their leaves get kind of semi-defoliated, but we don't think it's insect or disease. We think it's some other stuff that I won't get into today. But it, they just haven't performed as well lately. So I was cautious to put it in. But it's... It, I think it's a neat plant. There's a fellow from Iowa State who now works for us, um, T. Vaughan Feely, just got hired on at the DNR, but was an extension specialist. He thinks there's some severe root rots and threats for hackberry. Mm -hmm. But in the landscape, it's performed very well. So, you know, it's one of those trees probably can live 50, 70 years. So I think it has its place, but it's, it's starting to show some challenges. The poplar tulip tree is not on your list. Why? Well, again, I only had an hour, and I actually went over that. So tulip poplar, we're kind of far north for that. I mean, we're getting kind of north. It's more of a southern species. You, you see it. I've seen some really nice tulip poplars, like in Pella and further, like in Burlington. But we're starting to push it up here a little bit. Um, so it's more from a hardiness and stuff, and I'm not sure what the hardiness zone on it, but I think we're getting a little far north for it. But if a person wants to experiment with it, it's, it's fast growing, but I have seen some, a couple in my neighborhood took some of the storms pretty bad. That, that wood seems to be fairly weak, but so I, to me it's more of a hardiness. But they're a unique plant. They have a, if you don't know about them, they have a flower that's not really showy, but then it is showy. It's just this, just this cup. And it's, it's just really kind of neat. It's green, but it's kind of a, just a, a bright green that's kind of unique to the tree. And then in the fall, it turns kind of a brown, and it just kind of looks neat with the green leaves behind. And the leaf looks like a tulip. So mm -hmm. it would be a place, if I had a place with some good space where if it fell down or broke, it wouldn't hurt anything. Um, but again, I'm a little concerned about the hardiness on it. Could you recommend nursery sources for some of these today? No. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what I can tell you about nurseries is, you know, just go there. Go to the different nurseries. Talk, see what stock they have. You know, just make your own decisions. Um, there's a lot of good nurseries in town. I mean, I've, I've bought from a number of nurseries, um, but I'm not allowed to make recommendations. What about the cat surra tree? Um, I know a little bit about the cat surra tree, not a lot. Cat surra tree, if you don't know what it is, it actually looks a lot like red bud. Mm -hmm. um, and it, there's been some tests, and I know clear up in the Ames, it's done well and done okay. But again, it's one of those I think does good sometimes and not good all the time. But it's got a leaf very similar to red bud. But I think the diff, one of the differences in ID in it, I've seen them sometimes, they actually look like a red bud tree. I don't think they have the same bark character. Red, the neat thing about red buds, they do have kind of a flaky reddish orange bark that's very ornamental too. But I don't think the cat sura tree has that. The other thing is the leaves are opposite arranged and <coughs> red bud is alternate. But um, it's one of those I think is again, hardiness is somewhat questionable. But with that, I've seen it as far north as Dubuque. Mm -hmm. I was up there one time. I would check with Iowa State. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough to say yes or no, but I know it's, it's been variable. We have friends with one in Michigan. Okay. Uh, but it's right by a lake, so I don't okay. know if there's a lake effect or not. Okay. But it's, uh, they're, they're lovely. We have one. It's great. There's, there's a lot of plants I didn't mention. Like I said, I'm a dirt forester, not a horticulturist, a lot of yes. landscape art. I mean, there's some great people in the audience I know that can give you some more of those intricate plants, too. I mean, there's, this was just the start. If Jeff Isles was here, he could do a three-hour thing on just selection. On, yeah, on cultivars. There's a ton. So I just touched the surface. But Mark, you did a great job. Thank you. Keep going. We got, keep going. <laughs> yeah. See? Okay. Is it too late to trim oak trees? <sighs> Is it too late to trim oak trees? Based on the weather, if it, if it stays cold, like today it's warm, obviously, and it's great. But if it stays in the 30s and 40s the next couple weeks, I would still, if you had to prune an oak tree, you could still do it. I usually say March 1st is my cutoff, but I've had a couple tree services, another call me, and I basically told them if we stay in the 30s and 40s, with the exception of a warm day here and there, you know, maybe to the 15th of March or so. Um, I'm just, I'm probably overly cautious. Some people say April 1st. Some people even say April 15th, but if we stay cool, which I, I saw the forecast, I think we're going to see some 30s and stuff and some cool nights still. The next couple weeks you still need to be okay. You know, if you're going to prune them basically December, January, February into, you know, to the end of February, typically is when I target oaks. Okay. That's the best way to try to prevent oak wilt. Because if you don't know about oak wilt, it's caused by a fungus. And it's, there's a little insect that carries it. So all right, obviously right now that insect's not going to be flying around. There's been some research that's shown that those wounds, when they're wounded, usually dry out within 72 hours or a little longer. So in these conditions, we're not going to get warm enough where the insect would be out, the disease would be there. So I think in general, okay. a few more weeks. Okay. Uh, when river birch tree limbs large large limbs from a river birch are broken or removed from storm damage should the tree be cut down because of insect invasion in the cuts on any tree if there's you know major breakage and stuff if you can prune that tree back correctly and we don't have time today but back to the branch collar and there's good there's actually a publication from Iowa State when I worked there I helped put together called managing storm damaged trees it talks about how to make the proper cut and all that if those, on any species, if those cuts are made, and when that tree's left, if there's at least 50% of the crown left, I think you can leave the tree and wait to see what happens. If it's pruned correctly, then those wounds will try to close on their own. And the other thing is, if you have large wounds, though, you prune it correctly, and then you watch it over time to see if you start to get decay. And then if it starts to become hollow, a problem, then you may reevaluate and say, okay, we need to remove it. But just because you have breakage, doesn't mean, you know, for some trees it could take 15, 20 years before there was enough decay that that tree, so you're going to have to evaluate it. But in most cases, if it's pruned correctly, trimmed up, and even in some cases people will get a, a tree after storm damage and there's only 40%, but that tree means everything to them. Prune it up, fix it, see what happens, give it some time. I actually worked with the town of Fruitland 
that had a tornado this year and was with a lady and I bet there was 10% of the crown left. And she looked at me and said, I will not cut that tree down. <laughs> and I said, okay. I mean, I understood. I told her, okay, let's plant some more. And then once, if you can, maybe take that, and that tree may not live a couple years, but that was something that survived. So I understood what she was trying. To me, if it's not a hazard, but if that tree is over the house and, and the damage from the storm was enough that that tree is dangerous, then it should come down. That's the first thing you should evaluate after a storm before you even start to try to fix it is, is that tree safe? If you can't, maybe hire a tree service or have somebody come evaluate it or an arborist, have them look at it and see if it's even worth fixing. Okay. What about American Beach? And would you tell me the, the uh, Latin name? American Beach would be Fagus grandifolia. That's exactly right. I didn't okay. know whether I was reading it correctly. Yeah. I still remember. Um, yeah. American Beach is one of those, again, that um, is not normally found around here, but I've seen a few in the landscape. You know, for all these, some of these plants, <clears throat> or someone comes like to me, and, or someone like me says, it's not normally found in the landscape, it's not used, you can try some of these things. There's some really nice ones on the Iowa State campus, tucked away on a kind of a north-facing slope by the president's house in the shade that do real well. There's some unique ones over in um, Bentendorf, too. There's actually a tricolor. Or it's kind of a purple leaf uh, beach, some unique ones. So it's one of those, though, that would need some shade and uh, kind of a protected site. Would but it work along? <laughs> may work for Mr. and Mrs. Cottonwood. Or yeah, yeah, but yeah. again, it's one of those that um, it's just not commonly used, and I haven't seen enough of the landscape to say, boy, that tree's going to grow. This person has a new ash tree in the front yard that's about four inches in diameter. Would you recommend replacing it now with a different tree? You know, I get asked that tree, asked that tree. I get asked that question a lot, and... Um, it's this, the only tree. I it's the only it. tree. <laughs> <laughs> this pest is not here yet. And, and to say that it's going to come, um, I think it's going to come. But could be next year, could be here, could be 25 years. So it's one of those things I just struggle with telling someone to cut a tree down because something might happen. Um, you know, to me, if you get 15 years out of it, while you're living in that house and you still have to cut it down, you got good 15 years out of it. I mean, so you just got to kind of look at it that way. I, I would really struggle cutting it down. I just think, you know, this, again, it's not here. I think it's going to show up, but it could show up in the Quad Cities and then take 15 years before we get it in Iowa City. Or it could stay on the south side of town and not hit the north side of town for a long time. The insect does fly. Once it gets to a place, they used to think it was only a mile. Now I think it can fly up to six miles. But it usually gets carried through firewood and nursery stock and stuff like that. So that's a toughie. Um, if you had room to plant something else near, you could. But again, it's, I would enjoy it as long as you can. And then in 15 years, if something happens, you've got to replace it. You've got to replace it. OK. This person has a three-year-old crimson king maple that they bought as a bare root tree. Okay. It, it grew one inch last year. Is that normal? And should they replace the tree? And is there anything to do to speed up the growth? It's pretty normal. They, <laughs> normally maples grow, especially the Crimson King or the purple varieties, they grow pretty slow. I showed you the one in my dad's yard, and that, that thing's 30 years old, and it's only like 15 feet tall or 20 feet tall. I mean, they, they grow okay. They, they probably only grow. thing is, if you just planted it, bare root, um, it'll probably take a year or two before it to get going. And then it should you know, grow up to six inches. If you're near a woodland or anything, I'd pluck it out and do something that's not going to be invasive to that woodland. But if you're in the middle of town, I, I can't argue as much. Um, but uh, the thing that trees need to grow is they need uh, good water first couple years, keep the mowers away from them, 
and, and don't fertilize them. In most cases, they'll grow on their own. Our soils, you know, we say they're rough, but they're not terrible. Most of the nutrients they need are there. Um, sometimes we tend to over-fertilize, promote a lot of top growth with a lot of nitrogen, and then those roots don't balance. So the big thing is good moisture management the first couple years, and, you know, give it some time and it'll get going. But if it's near a woodland, I, I'm hesitant just because it can be very invasive in the woodlands. If you have a, um, if you have a mature blue spruce with needle cast, is spraying successful? How harmful is spring spraying to the environment, birds, etc.? Um, <clears throat> the sprays that are used are fungicides. It's caused by a fungus, and they are somewhat successful. The problem is, though, you have to spray twice, and on a big tree like that, you could be spending a couple hundred dollars to spray each time a tree like that. Um, but the, the fungicides that are available do have some effect. The thing is, if it has the needle cast, you pretty much have to spray it every year for the rest of its life. Now, the thing with that needle cast is, though, it will not kill the tree overnight. I mean, it's, it, it takes years for it to slowly cause the die back on the tree and to kill it. So it's one of those things you can tolerate it a little bit. But um, you need to uh, just make a judgment. Again, you could spray it. The thing is, if you spray it, it will... Somebody's singing... I'm losing my concentration. If you spray it, um, it it's not going to cure it. All it do, the spraying is going to do is going to prevent from the disease from getting worse. So that's why you got to spray each year to keep preventing it. And if you have a lot of needles that are lost in the lower portion, those needles will not grow back on that spruce. So if, it's, if the bottom branches are gone, they will stay gone. But if the rest of the tree is okay and you can prune some of those off, and it's a beautiful ornamental tree to some people. It may be worth spraying to keep it that way. So you just have to make that judgment. Um, most fungicides tend to be a little more safer than some of the insecticides. So um, if they're sprayed correctly at the right rates and stuff, there are chemicals out there that can be used correctly in the landscape. Mm -hmm. It's just when they're incorrectly used is when they become the worst. Mm -hmm. Great. These people are looking for a small tree that can tolerate clay. They had planted a Rose of Sharon tree that was uh, grafted on a, a, the shrub grafted on a tree stem. Uh -huh. And that was split in two by the heavy snows. Okay. So they're going to replace that with something else, and they want to shade a hosta bed. So a small tree to shade a hosta bed. Betula plasticiata. <laughs> yeah. um, I made that up. Uh, <clears throat> clay is so tough. Some of the crab apples are pretty adaptable to some pretty tough conditions. So they may want to look at some of the varieties of some of the crab apples. And there are some that will get 20, 25 feet tall that um, may do all right. You know, the Japanese tree lilac is used a lot in urban environments, but I think it may struggle. But I, I would look at some of the cultivars of crab apple. I've seen some crab apples in some pretty tough environments. Not, to be honest, nothing likes clay. I mean, nothing likes clay. But, to me, clay is usually urban, and I've seen some crab apples tolerate some pretty tough conditions. So you may look at some of the varieties of crab apples. Would you ever uh, suggest amending the soil in a situ situation like that? With the tree, can you make enough difference with compost and one thing and another there's, to make a difference? There's been a, a lot of research and some research done about amending soils. And actually, at the, uh, in Washington, D.C., at some of the pet areas where people come in from all over to look at things, They've amended soils to plant trees, but they've amended the whole area mm -hmm. where they've gone down like 20 inches and they've taken everything out and spent millions and millions of our tax dollars and put in good stuff and then planted stuff. And they've had some success, but on a smaller case, the thing is if you amend the soil and everything else outside of it is not good, mm -hmm. those roots will tend to go to where things are not so good and stop and then kind of... So you, you tend to, however big you modify it, you're, you're going to plant a tree basically in a pot, mm -hmm. however big you modify it. You'd have to modify a pretty large area. So how big, what if you did a 20-foot square area? Would that be big enough to get started with it? That would be big enough to get started, especially if you were going to, you know, use a, a smaller tree or something like that. Because there are, you know, you think about trees that grow in pits and stuff like that in our downtown areas. And the thing to think about is the, 
the more space, that, the more cubic feet that you make, the better off it's going to be. The challenge you have if there's a lot of clay, if you have a lot of good soil there, the water goes down through and then just kind of comes through like a bathtub and just kind of comes right back up. So if the underlying soil is clay, your drainage is still going to be really tough. Yeah. That's a lot of work for what some people will do in clay soils, and there's some good uh, literature out of Iowa State, is they'll plant high. They'll take that plant and either kind of berm it or they'll bring it up out of the, the landscape just a little bit and still plant it at the right depth on what they call the collar, but they'll bring that tree up a little bit and have had some luck with drainage situations that way. What kind of shade do pagoda dogwoods make? Um, are they slow or fast growing, and are they an understory tree? They're an understory tree. Um, I'd say they're medium as far as growth rate. Mm -hmm. And when I've seen them in the landscape, their shade is fairly dense. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a, again, they have that, they just have this layer effect that you see almost gaps in the canopy that just have a really neat, um, <laughs> look to them but uh, you know when I was looking for pictures I found a lot of pagoda in kind of in the Iowa City area and stuff and found a lot of ones that were doing pretty well. Pretty. Does apple fire blight respond to pruning and other treatment or is it pretty much terminal? Fire blight is not terminal. Um, it's actually caused by a bacteria. It gets on apple trees, crab apples and some of the ornamental pears. <clears throat> pruning does slow it down a little bit, but you have to prune down into live wood, cut out what they call kind of the cankers. Um, there's some good information again from Iowa State on that. There are a few chemicals available to help manage that, but it's a tough one to, pruning will slow it down though. Okay. What are good trees to use as a windbreak? White pine, Norway spruce, one I didn't mention, eastern red cedar. Is a, listen to you guys. It's, it's native. It's, it doesn't have a lot of disease problems. Um, it grows a long time. It, it's kind of rough. It's ugly in the winter, though, kind of purple-brown. But hey, it lives. It gives you protection. It does what you want. Bagworms like it, and a lot of the evergreens bagworms. Another one is arborvita is okay, too. But arborvita and white pine... I work for the DNR, so don't beat me up, but deer love arborvitae and white pine. So if you're not going to protect those trees, um, the church down across from Mayflower in Iowa City, they had lollipop arborvita because the deer would just eat up to six feet, you know, and eat everything around. But they like white, you know, the best white pine and arborvita, if you have deer, is just put them on the ground and let them eat them right off the ground. Don't even plant them. Because if you're not going to, you know, just say, here, deer, deer, and just eat them. And then don't plant the tree. But you're going to have to protect those plants if you're going to use those. Um, if you're going to plant a windbreak, though, and you can plant two rows, plant two rows and plant two different species. So plant a row of, of like, say, white pine or, or a row of um, Norway spruce. Another one that does okay is white spruce or Black Hills spruce. It has some susceptibility to the needle cast. Um, so there are a variety of ones, but if you're going to plant two rows, I would plant two different types, okay? And space them widely. 